I want you, brothers and sisters, you're listening to this, to take some time to imagine with me a church. People who call themselves the body of Christ, and they sit around and they are smoking cigarettes, or you can even have one of them smoking cigarettes. And then they will tell you the body of Christ around them who aren't smoking, they will tell the person who is smoking that it, everything's okay. You know, we love you. You can keep on smoking. Smoking is not that big of a deal. Jesus died for you, not to set you free, but so that you can keep on staying in your addiction. I want you to imagine with me a body, the body of Christ, the church, who is having a gathering, and somebody who is swearing, they're, they're cursing, they're cursing up a storm, and there may be even children present. And those who are not swearing, say to the person who is cursing and swearing, hey, it's okay. You know, I talk like that too sometimes, you know, when I, when I stub my toe, you know, against the countertop, everything's okay. You know, you can just swear as much as you want. You can curse as much as you want, you know. And then let's say that somebody raises the question, hey, I thought that the Bible says, you know, you know, in James chapter three, that we're not, they were supposed to be careful about the words that we use. And then the reply from the body of Christ is that, oh, you know, don't act like you've never said a, a cuss word before. You can't judge. Don't act like you've never said anything before. You know, how dare you cast judgment upon, you know, this brother or sister over here who's cursing, you know, and then everyone starts to attack the person who was cursing and swearing or um, who, who speaks out against the cursing and swearing. I'm sorry. How insane does that sound? So you have the church here who is defending smoking, defending swearing, and I want you to imagine another scenario. Just bear with me, guys. I want you to imagine another scenario where there's somebody, again, you have the body of Christ gathered together, and someone raises the comment that, hey, What's the point of sharing the gospel? You know, we can share the gospel with our attitudes. We don't have to open our mouths. We can just share the gospel and not have to worry, you know, about offending anyone. And everyone agrees. They say, yeah, that's right. You know, because the Bible, you know, it says that we're living epistles. You know, we don't have to go around and, you know, we don't ever have to, to share Jesus with anyone. We don't have to tell them to repent from their sins. You know, we're a nice pe we're nice people. We can give them gifts. You know, we can go ahead and love on them and encourage them to continue, you know, kind of living the lives that they're in. You know, we're not going to call them out because that would be unloving. We're not going to encourage the world to come to Jesus and come out of their sin. You know, that's unloving. You know, we just want to go continue to give them gifts, give them flowers, you know, and tell them just how wonderful they are. But we're not going to call them to repentance as Jesus commanded us because that's too harsh. That's too unloving. These people are broken souls and they need to feel loved. And then everyone agrees and say, yeah, that sounds great. You know, we're not going to go out and call the world, you know, who are broken and damaged and, you know, they're caught in addictions. They're caught in really serious, you know, issues and they're on their way to hell. We're not going to tell them about Jesus all the time. We're just going to love on them. You know, we're just going to create an atmosphere of acceptance. You know, that's what's going to lead them to Jesus one day, hopefully. You know, they can, even though they can die tomorrow, it's okay. We don't have to tell them, you know. It's, it's, they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out one day, we hope, you know. So imagine that scenario that everyone gets around and agrees with that, that mindset. And I have a few more here. Just, uh, just bear with me. <sighs> imagine somebody who struggles with overeating and gluttony and you know they're overweight please don't get offended with any of the um the examples that i'm using here these are very real examples that i've seen personally throughout you know my years of working in ministry but let's imagine with uh, imagine with me you have a person who's struggling with overeating and uh, gluttony 
and they feel bad. You know, they have heart disease, they have diabetes or an onset of diabetes. You know, they can barely move. They can barely walk. You know, they're out of breath when, you know, they, they start, you know, moving around and things like that. And they want, they're looking to the body of Christ for help. They're looking to their fellow brothers and sisters. And then everyone turns to that person and says, hey, you know, it's okay. Just go on and enjoy your food or go on and enjoy eating. It's okay. You know, you just have to take that food in faith. You have to, you know, have faith in Jesus that he can sanctify that cheeseburger that you're eating. <laughs> Guys, I know this sounds funny, but I have heard these things in the church. Just imagine with me, you know, that person who's looking for help and guidance, they're not really getting it. They're saying they, they actually attack the person who says, hey, you know, I know how to help you to overcome, you know, the, uh, the food addiction. I used to have that, too, or I know someone who used to have that, you know, let's let's let's, uh, you know, let's consider, you know, changing your your lifestyle. And I'm here to support you. And everyone gets angry at that person who's trying to help the person with the issue with overeating. They say, how dare you be so judgmental? How dare you lack faith? How dare you go over here and tell this person, and you're technically calling them, you know, fat, and you're not saying that they're, that Jesus accepts them, even though the person saying that, you know, is, they, they never said that God doesn't love them, but in their minds, when they hear correction, over smoking, over cursing, over anything, not sharing the gospel, over gluttony, or any other sin that is more, you know, widely accepted within certain church groups, they interpret that in their minds to think, oh, this person is saying that God doesn't accept me. Now, let's first talk about God's acceptance and really what <laughs> he calls us to. When we're in Christ, he says that we are a new creation let me go ahead and read that verse right here it's second corinthians 5 17 and it says therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things have passed away behold all things are become new did jesus die for us to so that we can continue being a slave to our appetite to the foods that we eat to smoking to cursing even though he's warned us about you know in james i will go ahead and read the verse right here it says right here in verse uh, 310 of james out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing my brethren these things ought not so to be out of the same mouth we praise god and we bless god with the same mouth that we use to say cuss words and to curse others. Guys, let this sit in. Let this sink in to your mind, to your heart. Just how serious, just how serious words are. Just how serious the actions that we, we, we do in our everyday lives. And just even the thoughts that we think. That everything has a consequence, ladies and gentlemen. We can't do anything that in this in this world that doesn't have a consequence. You know, if I say something, you know, that is false, other people will either A, accept what I'm saying, or B, they will have to have something to fight against because it is a falsehood. Falsehoods can bring confusion. You know, they can tear down and convolute, you know, the truth that we you know, have believed and that has been delivered to us in the scripture. You know, Paul himself, he said that if any man preaches another gospel, I'm paraphrasing here, if any man preaches another gospel other than what has been preached, even if an angel from heaven comes to you with another gospel, let them be accursed. And he says that twice, let them be accursed. We have to ask ourselves as Christians, you know, are we really in this all together are we really in this all the way or are we just using jesus and christianity you know as a cop-out as a, as a badge to add to our lives do we really believe that jesus has delivered us from our sins you know like overeating and cursing and 
you know, and, and laziness and so on and so forth, gossip, murmuring, you know, all of these things and so much more. Has he really delivered us? Do we believe that he has? And I know that there is a doctrine in the church today, you know, that teaches that we just can't stop sinning. Brothers and sisters, that's not true. What do I mean by that? Listen to the word and have the Bible speak for itself. Romans 6, 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2, it says, For as much, then, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has seized from sin, that he no longer should live the life of his time, the rest of his, his time, I'm sorry, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. First John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not, and if, not when, but if, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The answer is a resounding yes. We have the ability to stop sinning. Why? Because when we choose to sin, sin is a choice. It's not our body, you know, that we're enslaved to. It's not our addictions that we are enslaved to. Jesus died to set us free from that. We are operating in love, which is the first and second greatest commandment, as Matthew 22, 37 through 40 says. Walking daily in obedience is both love unto God and love unto our neighbor, which are the first and second greatest commandments, guys. We have to consider that deeply, because if we love our sin, then we are simply loving ourselves or loving our flesh in an unhealthy way. Guys, I, I don't want this to be misunderstood, you know, as the uh, perfectionism, which is like, it's a trait that someone has to attain accomplishments, you know, and never fail. And they're always, you know, they think that God is just up there, and, you know, looking down on them every time they, they do something. I'm not talking about making mistakes, and I'm not talking about someone being hard on themselves and not being forgiving and merciful to themselves and others. I'm talking about sin, I'm talking about not sinning. I'm talking about practicing the fruits of the Spirit and living the fruits of the Spirit. Um, one of them, which is self-control. You know, 1 Corinthians 15.34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Awake to righteousness and sin not. If we can't stop sinning, why is the Bible telling us over and over and over again that through Christ, and if we walk in the Spirit, you know, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the Scripture says, that we have the ability in Christ to stop. You know, as soon as you tell someone, hey, you know, you have the ability to overcome, you know, gluttony, smoking, you know, cursing, and these other habits that you're doing, everyone wants to start telling that person, hey, you can't say that. You're holier than thou. You're acting holier than thou. You know that you sin. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. How dare you tell that person to stop sinning or how dare you encourage them to stop? Guys, I use this analogy all the time. Um, you know, a lot of people like to say the, uh, the old phrase, uh, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? You know, but we also have to ask ourselves for discernment's sake, what would Satan say? Because Satan deceived gar uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he said to her, he started, he started, um, the first thing that he did was he cast doubt on God's word. You know, he said, has God really said that you should not eat of the tree? You know, surely he hasn't said that. I'm paraphrasing. But he cast doubt on God's word. If God tells us in his word that sin does not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace, and he's telling us to, to arm ourselves with the same mind as Christ, who suffered in the flesh and ceased from sin, or he never sinned, I should say, 
um because um let me reword that for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin uh first peter 4 1 through 2 says um you know we have to take these things seriously and put on the same mind that you know it says that we are to do um that is the mindset that we have and anything else that says that you know we can't do these things that you don't have the ability to stop sinning you're always going to be an addict and you're never going to overcome guys that is not the voice of god that is the voice of satan anyone who tells you that smoking is okay you know you're loved anyways and they're not trying to encourage you you know to come out of these addictions so that you know you can have better spiritual ammo and you can have discipline and self-control and have the fruits of the spirit actively working in your life and they're telling you you're loved regardless of what you do that is not the gospel folks that is not the gospel run for your lives you're confronted prayerfully god oh my gosh that voice you know that says that <laughs> god i just ask that you open the eyes of the listeners here that they will not be offended but you will that they will see what is being said here I'm not saying that, you know, that people can't struggle with addictions and that, you know, that they, you know, that God is not, you know, there for them, you know, to help them to overcome these things. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about the mindset that people have that when somebody is caught in a sin or that somebody's trying to justify a sin, that they are agreeing, not just a sin, but a, a very dangerous and detrimental bad habit, something that can confuse the church, something that can confuse others, such as smoking. You know, they say, oh, the Bible doesn't say that smoking is a sin. It's not a sin, you know, but the thing is that it's dangerous. It's very dangerous to yourself. Secondhand smoke is extremely dangerous to others. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, the Bible says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. God said that in Hosea. We have to take these things seriously, brothers and sisters. Smoking and all these other things, overeating. We are chopping away at the life that God has given us. We are destroying the health that he has placed within us who we are fearfully and wonderfully made you who are listening to this you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you have to understand just how serious and just how subtle just how deceptive satan is you know to try to get you and other people especially other christians caught in these bondages that they just can't see through because the culture that they're trying to create, the Satan is trying to create in the church is that we are not dead to sin. Even though Romans 6, 2 through 4 says, God forbid, how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It says, con uh, continuing on, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Paul continues and said, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life so i don't want to make this video too long guys and i i know that these topics are really um difficult to swallow for a lot of you you probably listening to this and feeling very angry and attacked i don't want you to feel that way i want you to be set free my heart for you is to understand the father's love for you and the true love is not just enabling people and giving them gifts and giving them flowers and making them feel you know with their five senses a certain way feeling good to their flesh that is not love that is not love true love it sets free true love empowers you to overcome to break the chains that the enemy has placed upon your mind upon your body upon your soul he wants you god wants you to overcome to be an overcomer to be strong to have his mind guys i want you to understand this so badly it is so easy to get on the defensive when you're hearing a message like this and be like oh my pastor didn't tell me that you know it doesn't matter what your pastor says what does the bible say what does god say do you believe the words of god or do you believe the words of man let god be true and every man a liar in jesus name his word you know it says so many things that i've just mentioned here i will continue on and read one more verse um the main one is um 
you know, when we look at the life of Cain and what he has done to his brother and how God addressed Cain right before he slew his brother, it says right here in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. You see that Cain, right before he slew his brother, God told him that you shall rule over sin. Sin is a choice. He said, if, you, if thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? God is asking Cain a question. You know, I've heard certain people get offended when questions are asked. You know, Jesus asked questions to try to expose the error of the thinking of the people, especially the Pharisees, you know, who he was addressing. Questions are an excellent form to, an uh, excellent tool, you know, to get people to consider a better alternative. And to help them to see, you know, the bigger picture. Because a lot of times we get so stuck into our own way of thinking that we just can't stop. You know, we just can't stop to consider, you know, uh, the other alternatives. You know, when people ask me, when was the last time you sinned? How can you ever talk about something like this? You know, how can you say that we have the ability to stop sin? You know, when people ask me that question, when was the last time that I sinned? Or they say, you think you're perfect, don't you? Like, you think you're perfect, huh? Um, what they are doing is they are not exercising faith in God or the power of Christ to set free. They do not believe that God can set us free and they do not believe his word when he said the verses that I've just shown and ju that I've just read here, you know, on this, on this video, you know, when they say that they're taking great pride in their humility. They say, praise the Lord. I need Jesus unlike you you know i i need jesus and i i need him every hour of every day and i will never be perfect hallelujah i am a sinner saved by grace i'm a wretched sinner and i need jesus every day unlike you who claims to be perfect and who doesn't sin you know that's what they say and they make the claim that i don't need jesus or others who preach this message don't need god that is so totally not true we need jesus just as much as they do the only difference is that one party is obeying the word of god and obeying the fact that god um that is, is exercising faith in the power that god can set free uh, and that they are abiding in christ to set free because when we abide in the vine we bear much fruit we have to examine what fruit is being born in our lives. And that's the last thing that I will end this message on, guys, is we have to examine the fruit that our lives are preaching. What fruit are we living? Is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? Because Jesus said a bad tree cannot bear good fruit and a, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. So, and that's in uh, John 15. And I encourage you guys to take some time to read that. Uh, go ahead and read that after this message is done. But I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up here. And I just encourage you guys to go back and, and look over the verses that I've mentioned in this video. I will probably post them down in the description box below. And I just pray that you guys will understand the heart of this message and that I am not preaching this message, you know, as an attack against anyone to call anyone in particular out. You know, um, there's I don't have anyone in mind, you know, that I'm that I am uh, using this message uh, that, I, that I am preaching this uh, message to, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, this is not in that spirit. And uh, if you are challenged in a healthy way by this message, if you are feeling convicted, go ahead and pray after this and ask the Lord to help you, to give you a new mind, to give you a new spirit, and to give you a new attitude towards his word and towards the faith and to help you to count the cost and ask, examine yourself, Paul said. He said, examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. Because no one who walks in the light and claims to know or no one who walks in the darkness and claims to know jesus um you know those two are incompatible what fellowship does light have with darkness first john 2 4 he says that he that says i know him talking about god he that says i know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar 
and the truth is not in him guys i will end on that note just pray and ask god to reveal these things in your heart and do not be stubborn against the holy spirit do not be upset you know because you believe something that was false do not allow satan to let your pride get a, get the better of you or shame to get the better of you when you face shame and you face lies you know you grow you become a better person allow this opportunity you know of of seeing the truth you know for the first time you may have just heard this message and you are now waking up to that let this be freedom let this I'll, let this message minister to your soul let this set you free because jesus himself said in john 8 32 and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free and that's what the christian walk is all about ladies and gentlemen god bless you and take care